Hello everyone, it's me, Emily Braun, owner of the International Lifestyle Consulting, and today I was planning to launch a new series of interviews with professionals. Why? Because I know from my personal experience and from experience of many other people who were considering relocation, that it's not so easy that people really need to prepare for it and prepare in advance. And because I get getting so many different questions, how to do and what to do and in what order to do it, I decided to invite professionals who are together with me will clarify this road will answer your possible questions and it will help you, my dear future relocators, or people who are thinking just about it, or maybe just curious about it, to, to think, to listen, to consider, and to come back with a question maybe during today's conversation, maybe later when you will have questions to the poet. And the first person who I wanted to introduce to you, I mean, professional in the list of professionals who would really help you along the road, it's uh, financial advisors. And I would like to introduce uh, to you uh, a financial advisor from Alberta, Canada, Todd Schmeckel. So Todd has been financial advisor for at least a decade. And he is proudly serving and assisting clients across Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario to achieve their financial uh, goals. His primary focus is on providing goals-based advice, ensuring that each client's unique aspirations and ambitions are at the front, forefront of their financial journey. Todd has excelled in helping individuals plan save, and ultimately achieve their goals of living and retiring abroad. So it is taught a uh, firm belief that by aligning our financial decisions with our long-term goals, we can unlock extraordinary possibilities and create a prosperous future. So Todd looks forward now to sharing his expertise, insights, and experiences in finance. And again, the first step that I would advise every person who is considering, thinking, planning to allocate, actually to connect with financial advisor, if you have already one, or to ask me and I would connect you with financial advisors that I know, and Todd is one of them, because before actually you know, paving the road, we all need to understand what finances we have, how we can actually plan our future, because without financial support, it's kind of clear for everyone, we cannot be sure that we can achieve our goals. And uh, it's a reason I invited Todd. And Todd is working with uh, people pre-retirement age, retirement age, and people from uh, all walks of life for years. And having experience of serving these people, I believe he, he will help us uh, to clarify some of the matters in general. Obviously, it's not personal financial advice, but it's just suggestion and advices. And by the way, I'm asking my Please forgive me, Americans, uh, who are listening now, because today I am offering you a conversation with a Canadian financial advisor. But actually, the same steps, the same ideas you need to consider from your side. The only difference, and I'm working for Canadian and American market, is we are different country with a different legislation and probably some different abbreviation when we are speaking about financials, I mean, pension plan, mutual funds, or name of the, you know, different programs, but actual framework is the same. 
what Canadians should consider in this regard and what do I mean when they are planning, preparing or thinking only about possible relocation. And by the way, I am speaking for full-time and part-time relocation because we know Canadians sometimes prefer to live like half year in Canada and half year abroad. Okay, yeah, if I, I think those are, are slightly different situations in terms of taxation and in terms mm -hmm. of uh, benefits, particularly in terms of investment benefits or benefits from the Canadian government, such as OAS or CPP. If you're going to relocate permanently, that's going to have an effect on your OAS. And you must have lived in Canada for at least 20 years to be able to collect OAS. And then if you move abroad, your OAS could be clawed back, back completely. It, and each situation is different and each situation needs to be sort of investigated. And what I see with people on a regular basis is they just decide they're going to move abroad without, without having uh, consulted people like yourself, Emily, or without having cons cons considered consulting a, a, a tax account or an accountant in terms of what they're going to be affected by. Residency is determined in a number of ways in Canada, and residency then determines which accounts you can operate from abroad. So, for example, you can run a TFSA from abroad if you have Canadian residency. If you don't have Canadian residency, you can have a TFSA, but you can't add to your TFSA. So the only benefits are is to take the money from it tax-free and to have growth contributed tax-free. Thank you. Very good uh, life hack even for me. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. RSPs are slightly different in terms of what you can contribute and what you and uh, what you can't contribute and how that works. I can't comment on on the U.S. system because that's a that's a system that's beyond my my understanding in terms of taxation and in terms of investments. You also need to make sure you're working with an advisor that can still work with you if you're abroad. Some firms do not allow advisors to work with people abroad, and you need to consider if you're Canadian that Canada is taxed on it. So our Canadians are taxed on their world income but their benefits are only provided based on Canadian income. And so that you, you end up with radically different amounts of income. I think your best bet for most people in Canada is to start to work with a, a financial advisor and making sure that you save the appropriate amount of money to, to make that work and to engage someone like Emily. And I, I'm not sure that if, if Emily has said this or not, but I think that before you choose a place to live, you should visit a place and maybe visit a number of places and get and get to see these places and then figure out what your costs are. I think the number one problem I find in financial advisory services today and financial planning is that people don't know what they're going to need to spend. And if you don't know what you're going to need to spend, you end up making it up and that causes a big problem in terms of shortfall, to be honest. So it's actually the reason that I created my business, because I realized that people don't have enough knowledge, practical knowledge of this or other countries. They might have only, you know, vacation experience, traveling experience. And I was promoting before COVID actually lifestyle discovery tours. And I'm on top of changes in the country price wise and even, you know, different region in a country might actually have different cost of living. And I'm very happy that you outlining again that people should work with professionals. It's not enough just to search internet to find some, you know, articles and legislation and stories for other people, which might be applicable, you know, for other people. But each of us in every financial situation is different. Thank you. Yeah, and even residency for for Canada is such a, a mixed bag of what can sit, what is to be considered resident and what is to be considered not resident by the Canadian government. I know that I have a number of clients that, that have predominantly moved to South America and uh, mostly Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama. And you have, you have different tax treaties with Canada and those countries and how things are going to be taxed. 
And just because you don't qualify for a benefit here doesn't mean you won't qualify for a benefit there and vice versa. Because with when there's a, um, a social agreement between the company or countries, not companies, the um, some of your years here will add be added to some of your years there, which could result in you getting a benefit down the road that you might not get from the beginning. Uh, but I think these things are all very important to have sort of a decent understanding of before you move somewhere. Very interesting, very interesting. And the next question I would ask, so what time, what type of funds uh, can people, and I mean now Canadians, use uh, by receiving the transfers abroad? Uh, if you know, let's let's speak about Mexico because I understand with every country it might be different story based on the channels. But you mentioned Mexico, like your clients going to Mexico. I know that Mexico accepting now thousands of people from Canada and United States as well. So, what you know from your experience about funds that people can use being in Mexico? So in Mexico, Canadians, my advice to Canadians is before you divest yourself of everything in Canada and move to Mexico is you go to Mexico and live a couple of years and maintain your residency in Canada. Maybe that's a home, maybe that's an address property. You have to look at the residency requirements and continue to operate your accounts directly from uh, Canada through Mexico. It's very easy for advisors to transfer funds from Canada to Mexico. And there's a number of websites that you can actually hook up to your bank account. But I often have clients who buy property in Mexico and we just wire the funds directly either to the realtor or to their lawyer in Mexico. So the process is not as difficult as I think people make it sound. Where it is difficult is people pop down to Mexico and decide they're going to buy a house. Well, yeah. now, how are you going to get your money? That's, that's problematic, especially if you, and so I know of one situation, a lady lives in Puerto Vallarta. She went there during COVID, got COVID, decided never to come home, decides to buy a house. The bank says, you can't take your money. And she's like, what do you mean I can't take my money? They're like, well, you have to come here to, to sign the papers. We have to see you to transfer this money. So she ended up coming back to Canada. And, and then I had a conversation with her. In the end, we transferred all her funds here, and we just transfer them by a wire service to Mexico when she needs them now. So these are things you want to think of before you get there, because you can't. it's not Canada, and the rules are different, and how you, the mortgages are different, too, and whether you'd qualify for a mortgage. But once you're there, and you've used services to get there, and you've, Mexico does have a, a pension agreement with Canada, so your, your OAS can be serviced in Mexico. Your CPP can be serviced in Mexico. And you can, can I ask up. you, what do you mean service? Like it can be transferred directly without any taxes? We can and actually no. So Mexico and Canada have a tax agreement. Yeah. Generally speaking, if there's no tax agreement, you're going to lose 25%. But Mexico's mm -hmm. tax agreement is 15%, I believe. So your OAS can be directly deposited into a Mexican bank or can be directly deposited into a Canadian bank and tramp, and you can make use your credit card or your bank card to take the money out. The same thing with your CPP it can be directly transferred to you there. I would say that most people that I work with maintain residency of some sort in Canada and they transfer all of their funds stay in Canada and they just transfer portions into the into Mexico when they need them. And I, one client calls this the Canadian tax, uh, but he also feels that there is potential for unstableness in South America. And if you ma maintain a residency requirement in Canada and keep your money in Canada, you don't have the, potentially the same instability, uh, particularly in currency, right? But everything can move from Canada to, the, to Mexico fairly easily. And it's easy to get your money out of your RSP. So on a monthly basis, we either transfer money directly into your bank account in Mexico or to one of these services. And there are a number of services that people use. And we transfer money directly into bank accounts like Scotia bank accounts that are U.S. bank accounts. And people just use their credit cards or their bank card to take the money out. So both things work by totally moving all your assets there or by maintaining the residency here. It's more of a situation is what you're comfortable with. 
my advice would be you'd start with maintaining assets in Canada until you're comfortable where you're going to live. So actually what I'm advising people when I uh, already had some experience living for a couple of months, at least in Mexico, or oh, they sure, as they say, 100% that Mexico is their place, actually to start from residency, to apply mm -hmm. for temporary residence through the Mexican consulate in Canada, closest like Calgary, Toronto, Vancouver, because with residency, in Mexico, you can open bank account in Mexico. Now you cannot do it without it, like without having temporary residence. And it's an established direct channel between money transfer between Canadian bank and uh, Mexican bank. And I believe that it's possible to give U.S. financial advisor authority from legal perspective. Like if people, for example, living in Mexico, can they sign for you authorization to transfer uh, money directly or via the account? Can it be the case? Yep, they can directly do that. That's an excellent. What, what your chat are getting people to do is way is I would say a step ahead of where most people are. I find most people move down to Mexico, they don't have residency, and so th then they buy a piece of property, then they start trying to get residency, and then they're like, "Well, I need money." Well, the, they don't have a bank account, so. Where are we transferring money? So this is why I often have to transfer money directly to a lawyer or to a real estate agent, which from my perspective is a little nerve wracking because I don't know who the people I'm transferring <laughs> money to. And so, so a good example is a client moved down to Jalisco, I think it's called, I think you say, Jalisco, and they Jalisco bought a property. Yeah. yeah. So we had to transfer $850,000 to a realtor, which I was, I was a little bit on comfortable with, but well, they knew the realtor, they were very comfortable with it. So we did it. My preferred way would be is that you do what Emily says, you get residency, you get a bank account, I'll transfer you the money in your name. Yeah. And I can tell even more, I get more and more connections in Mexico. And I myself already went through this residency process. So I really can advise in this regard. I mean, to Mexico, I cannot relocate to all countries I'm working with, but speaking about Mexico, I'm really comfortable. And I have lawyers now, immigration lawyers, taxation lawyers, and business lawyers in Mexico who would help with any possible questions along the road. But Mexico, it's really simple case in regards to residency and relocation. So what I would advise and what Todd confirmed, you start coming with me, <laughs> speaking with me, you start from the residency and I can help explain how to do it. It's pretty easy. You go to Mexico, you get your residency, you open bank account, you establish your residency and banking channel between Canada and Mexico. And after then, probably you will come at least once back to uh, Canada. You provide this information to your financial advisor. I don't know, taxation advisor. And, and you have channel to transfer your money. And you have a sign agreement with your bank about online banking because it's very important. And after then, you can really withdraw your money, say, in a, any ATM machine in uh, Mexico. Only this way, you kind of are showing less of stress and actually money coming to you. Speaking about pension, Todd, and you mentioned OIS, uh, if people are living part-time in Mexico, say in Canada, so OIS is still coming. If people are relocating, say, after a life of 20, 30 years in Canada, I'm wondering if OIS part is still will be, you know, part of pension. Yeah, if you're a natural born Canadian and you lived in Canada your whole life, 40 years essentially, after 18, your OAS is a benefit that will not be taken away from you. So you will then get your OAS regardless of where you live in the world. It's more a question of how you want it deposited, whether you want it deposited into your brokerage in Canada or directly into the country that you live in. Most people that I work with have it deposited either directly into a Canadian bank or directly here. And then we send them money once a month. But there are a number of people who have their money directly deposited into their, in Mexico is the obvious one, directly deposited into, into a Mexican bank. 
I have couples in Panama and Nicaragua, and neither one of those or none of those families directly deposited into those institutions. And those is, those countries are perhaps a little less banking savvy with North America than Mexico is. Mexico and Canada have a pretty good arrangement. And it's pretty, they also have a tax sharing arrangement, which isn't so good because a lot of Canadians think they're going to go there and avoid Canadian tax. You're not, if you pay, if you have OAS and you have CPP, you have Canadian income. So you should file Canadian tax still. But what is the Canadian tax in this regard? Because usually our CPP on OAS total, it's not so high. No, that's true. But if you, if you've saved, as we've talked a little bit about to live in Mexico, and you, and you say that as a Canadian citizen, you likely have an RRSP or you likely have a pension plan in Canada, either a defined benefit or a defined contribution plan. And those plans are going to generate Canadian income, which means you're going to need to file Canadian tax. If you don't file Canadian tax, you may get your OAS and your CPP may be restricted. Even CPP? Okay. Even just, CPP. Just... I was sure that CPP, it's what, you know, we contributed uh, as Canadians over the years and oh, always with us. No? What I'm talking about is if you don't file tax. Ah, yeah. Need to... So, and <laughs> often what I find is people leave Canada to relocate somewhere and they decide they're not going to file Canadian tax anymore. But let's say they work for a big Canadian company and they have a Canadian pension and they have CPP and they have OAS. Those are all Canadian income streams and those income streams need to or will be taxed by the Canadian government. So if you don't file tax, they'll start to say, well, you owe tax. We're not going to pay the benefits. So my advice would be if you have those streams of income, which most people who relocate from Canada to Mexico do have, they have either an RRSP, they have a TFSA, they have, might have a pension, a defined benefit or a defined contribution. They've got OAS and they've got CPP. They need to continue to file Canadian tax. Now, there's no problem with filing Canadian tax, and people get in their head that, well, if I don't file tax, then I won't have to pay. Well, the Canadian government and Mexican government have a tax agreement. So whatever you pay in Canada, you're not going to pay in Mexico. It's gonna it's gonna be the same tax regardless. And so it just makes your life a lot easier and your benefits from Canada a lot easier. Uh, to to maintain and to have flow easily by doing that. CPP is the Canadian Pension Plan, and OAS is the Old Age Security, which for Americans would be called Social Security, and there is no comparator in the States for CPP. In Canada, there are two government pension plans. In the States, there's just the social services. The, the total bigger than our Canadian total, but it's a different story. Right. Tell me, please, speaking about annuities, so it's considered income as well and can be transferred to other countries? It can be transferred to other countries as well. The annuity is bought usually by account company, either in the United States or in Canada, and it pays out monthly, and that is considered income as well and is taxable as well. Okay, but uh, we were speaking uh, about the case when people are living part-time in Canada in, or in Mexico, but when people are relocating and living, say, full-time in other country, they not consider it after some time actually residents, tax residents of Canada. What in this right. case with pension and all other? So they still, the Canadian government is still going to tax non-residents on their benefits from Canada? So you can be completely non-resident anymore and still get CPP and OAS. My advice would be you'd still file tax. You won't pay tax. You'll just file it. And it's just to keep your benefits flowing. Okay. So regardless, we are living full-time and part-time abroad. We, as a Canadians, responsible for filing every year our taxes to avoid actually problems with CRA and actually to keep our benefits on, correct? That's correct, yeah. And there are cases I know of where people have moved, and this is more a Mexican situation where they moved to Mexico and they've harmonized their, their CPP and OES with the Mexican system and they do not file Canadian tax anymore. But that harmonization has to be done through an immigration lawyer. Harmonized, you mean they, they created some entity in Mexico and kind of paying uh, taxes uh, in Mexico for 
Does yeah, so essentially what's, so Mexico has its own social systems and mm -hmm. its own pensions. So essentially what's happened is they're collecting the Mexican pension but the, and the CPP and uh, the Canadian government and Mexican government have said, all right, you've got, the person has enough years to collect the pension. We're just going to use the Mexican pension. And there's a cross sharing of funds between the two pensions. And you only collect the Mexican pensions then even though you contributed to the Canadian and you only pay in Mexican tax. It works exactly this. Your benefits are exactly or very, very similar. It just saves you filing tax in both places. I find for most Canadians, they still want to maintain their, their, their Canadian benefits just because it, I find that people often in South America feel a little bit, Canadians seem to feel a little bit unsure about the system and whether it's as stable as the Canadian system. And so they often maintain their Canadian connections, but there is ways of just moving everything to Mexico and just being a complete Mexican, just like you were born there. But it's more uh, difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaking about OAS, you mentioned about Canadians who were born in Canada. I am Canadian who was not born in Canada. And the maximum probably what I can get, it's a 30 years of uh, working. I mean, working... Uh, time in uh, Canada. What uh, might be OAS kind of rules in case of immigrants like me? So you have to have been in Canada at least 18 years from the year you were 18 to collect OAS. If you have been here less than 20 years and you move and relocate abroad, you will not, they will take your OAS back. So you have to have been here more than 20 years to get your OAS. So I will be 30 years, see. Uh, you'll be okay. You'll get your OAS. No, you're not going to get full OAS. You're going to get a proportion. So if, you know, you, to divide 32 by 40, that's 80%. Mm -hmm. You'll get 80% of whatever the, the amount is sort of thing. This is a very good question. And it's a question where all of these topics we've talked about, it's really important for you to go on to the CRA's website and look up residency there and look up how you qualify for CPP and OAS, particularly OAS. There's more rules around OAS. CPP Canadians have paid into, so they're guaranteed that, whatever they paid into, so to speak. But OAS can, is, is a different uh, kettle of fish and everybody's situation is unique. They're, the guidelines are broad, but everybody's situation is unique. Uh, so, for example, we're talking about people who just snowbird. That's what I call it when they go for half a year or whatever. Yeah. Every province has a different amount of time you can snowbird. In Manitoba, it's six months. In Alberta, it's 183 days, which is half a day more than six months. That sort of thing. And you want to really keep very accurate records about when you come and go. And there's not forgiveness in my experience with clients. Is there's not forgiveness by the government in that you're playing was delayed two days. You're better off coming back and forth with a few days on on either side. And that's usually around medical benefits that people are concerned about, right? It's, they, If you're snowbirding, almost all snowbirds that I work with maintain all of their financials in Canada. They may take their funds out of U.S. banks or Mexican banks with or, or debit machines with their credit card or their debit card, but they maintain everything in Canada. The one exception is when people snowbird and buy a piece of property. And in that case, I think that's more an Emily question about how you buy a piece of property and, and not be a resident or maybe you're a partial resident in Mexico. I don't know how people do that. No, in Mexico, you can buy property even you are not resident. By the way, the same in Canada. Foreigners can come to the country right. and, and buy the property. So yeah, I didn't uh, know if it was the same in Mexico. It, it is the same. Uh, there is difference between actually in what area you buy in Mexico or when you sell, if you foreigner or you a resident of Mexico. But in regards to buying property, there is no restriction in Mexico. Kind of everyone is welcome, but you know to to work with a lawyer, broker, uh, and paying required taxes. And One thing, another thing Canadians should consider is if you're going to completely relocate. Uh, and break your ties with Canada, there can be a departure tax in Canada. And that departure tax can be significant. It can be like, if you have a house and you're selling your house, it, you can end up selling a, or having to pay a lot of tax on that property. 
So before you relocate, you want to you want to speak to an accountant. And you want to make sure that you know where you're going and that you save the right amount of money. And I find sometimes people have saved a lot, the right amount of money and then their departure, uh, their departure results in a large tax, which means they don't have enough money. And so we want to make sure these things are all, all these things are checked off. And so you sort of need, you sort of need three people. You need an Emily. There's no question. You should have a financial advisor to save and grow your money. And that's going to take, most people don't move to Mexico at 27. They're moving in Mexico at 55, 65. So they need to, you need to grow your money within the Canadian system tax efficiently. And you need an advisor for that. The third thing is you need to get an accountant. Now you can have an accountant in Canada just to do your taxes on a regular basis. But before you move abroad, you want a relocation an accountant that understands relocation in that system. And there are not a ton of these and you should be prepared to pay for them because they're expensive. But once you get it up, once you get everything sort of squared away, it works really good. Do I understand correctly that you are one of these uh, advisors, accountant who people can connect with when they considering uh, the relocation uh, plan? Yeah, I'm an advisor that helps a lot of people relocate. But I, I'm, I'm, people sometimes confuse advisors with accountants. I'm not an accountant, and any any tax kind of conversation that we've had here should be checked against an accountant because tax law changes and tax agreements between countries change on a regular basis. And so I know probably just a bit more tax information than the average person, but I know how to grow the money to get it to what you need to, and then I know how to disperse the money to where you're going to be, but the tax issues are, are different and they're not investment issues. Uh, so for example, many Canadians move to go to Arizona. I know how to get them their money. I know how to help them buy a house, that sort of thing. I don't know their tax implications in, in by uh, making money in Arizona. Now I do know, I have a better idea of understanding of the States, but not the same as an accountant would. And then Mexico is a different country and their rules change all the time. And just to do this by like to print off a bunch of stuff off the internet and try it like that, it's going to end up costing you more money than just doing it the right way. So if your plan is to move to Mexico or wherever, start off by saving as if you weren't leaving Canada and save all the money you can, then hire someone like Emily, get an accountant, figure out your relocation thing. The money part, if you grow your money here, it's going to work here and it's going to work somewhere else. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much for your insights, for your information. And actually, the part two of my series, I'm inviting to speak and answer the question, exactly the person that you described, the next kind of professional in the line of professionals who can help. It's accountant, professional accountant with uh, international taxation experience who already working with people who are relocating to United States, to Mexico, and to other countries. It's exactly what I'm advising my clients. The first step, go to financial advisor. Be sure that you have enough finances. And I will provide you information about cost of living and specifics, like in this or other area. But I'm not going inside uh, and I'm not allowed and it's not my interest to provide you financial advice. But next step, it's taxation, international taxation accountant specialist, which will be the next guest on my series of live streaming event, how to prepare for relocation abroad, part of full-time living. And I'm speaking about snowbirds, and I'm speaking about people who are planning to relocate, maybe for the beginning or part-time, up to six months, three months, four months. But plans are change, might change after then, and for people who are actually considering full-time living. In every scenario, it might be different strategy on mm -hmm. how to do it correctly. And when we are speaking about exit tax, it's probably not exactly uh, your question. I'm speaking, usually I'm providing this example to Canadians. You need to consider your exit tax. And since mm -hmm. I can speak about only generally, I would connect you with person who would really tell you based on your particular situation how to deal, how correctly to sell your house. Because I've had clients who 
uh, sold her house before she even applied to the residency, before she even was considering, uh, and, and she was flying away. And what, like, what are you doing? But okay, it was already late. And sometimes you need to work kind of backward in order to fix situation. So in order not to be in this situation, I'm teaching about how to prepare correctly, how at what step to connect with different professionals who would ensure that you will get maximum of your finances, that you will not trespass your taxation rules in regards to Canada or in regard to country you are going to. And Mexico, and I'm outlined it several times, is a, a best case for us Canadians as well for Americans because we have a dual taxation agreement. We, because actually we are North American continent and we have a lot of agreements. I mean, our three countries, uh, Mexico, US in, and Canada, and many rules that might not work for other countries, speaking about banking, speaking about transfer of the money, actually less problematic when we are speaking about Mexico. Yeah, I would say I have two pieces there is that uh, there's always a good deal. And so what I find often is people find it what they consider to be a really good deal. So they got to hurry all of a sudden. There will be another good deal down the road. You don't need to hurry. And if you do hurry and you do your good deal, so to speak, and it doesn't go the way you want, retrieving your money from other places can be very difficult. And different, and they have different costs, like different fees and, and different title searches and that sort of thing. So you want to go, you want to do it slowly and use the right steps. And when you do, you have your accountant on, one of the questions that I will ask an accountant or a lawyer. I do a lot of wills and estate planning. I don't do wills. I do estate planning. A will comes from a lawyer. How should you buy a piece of property abroad? Should you buy it in your name? Should you buy it through a trust? That sort of thing. If you have children, they're going to inherit this. Inheriting things in different locations can be very problematic. So you want to make sure your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted before you do these things. Uh, so a good example is if you bought a piece of property in Arizona and you have an Alberta will, Alberta, Arizona does not have to honor an Alberta will. So now you have an orphaned piece of property there. What should you do? Should you have bought it in a trust or should you have an Arizona will? These are all things that are should be decided before you buy a piece of property because your heirs aren't interested in figuring this out. <laughs> so I what I... Thank you. Very good advices and insights. And I can tell you and our listeners that speaking about property in Mexico, and I would advise anyone, don't rush. Even after you relocate, take your time, live on rent, maybe live in different places before you would really engage in, in a purchase. Uh, because actually to sell in Mexico, it's not so easy like in Canada, not so quickly. It's possible, but it's not so quickly. There is more tax implication when you're selling. And there's a lot of new construction. There's a lot of new development in Mexico. It's not last deal. <laughs> it may be what like local broker telling you that it's the best possible opportunity, but it, it might be not the case. But speaking about the will, what is good in Mexico comparing with maybe Arizona. So when foreigners are buying property near the seashore or near the border, which sometimes is the same, it's actually all done through bank trust. And this bank trust, and I know kind of from uh, personal experience, actually include the will. So it's all done through the banking trust. So you uh, will and estate and hers kind of taking in consideration it's part of the package. But again, I can consult about this particular, you know, questions if more information is needed about property, about how correctly to buy property or even rent property in Mexico. Please connect with me because I have already a network of professionals, local professionals in Mexico, and I connected with a legal team in Mexico. And mission for this legal team is actually be on guard of foreigners to keep 
who coming, you know, to live in Mexico, really to help newcomers with real estate questions, with taxation questions, with, you know, business related questions, or maybe even personal security questions sometimes. So don't think that you will save money. You might save money by doing all yourself and just looking on internet information and getting all your information from YouTube, which is good for the beginning. But when you're really considering relocation, I would advise to connect with professionals, to build your financial plan, to have your taxation strategy clear, maybe after them to sell your home or maybe not. And again, every situation is different, but don't do your own when it's you know, such important step in your life, specifically when you're retiring, specifically when you're kind of actually risking your life saving if you make some mistakes. Mm -hmm. No, I couldn't agree with that more. Take your time. And most people are trying to move south, for, I find, for two reasons, weather and finances. Yes. Um, yes. And your finances honestly will go a lot further south uh, in Mexico, for example, than they will in Canada. But the place to try to save finances isn't on introducing, introducing yourself to the country and buying real estate. It's on living and quality of life after you do the things correctly, because it's very hard to reverse these things. It's even like I have clients that we just sold a condominium in Panama. And what came back from Panama was surprisingly less than what the con con or the condo sold for because it was taxes they didn't know about and they didn't use a lawyer. They just wanted to do it cheaply. And I think the cheaply often results in more expensive long-term. So pay what you need to pay to get good advice and then save your money later on on your lifestyle, which you will do for sure. Absolutely agree with you. So to buy property in a new country, it's quite kind of one box of work. <laughs> to, to sell it, it's a different kind of issues and keep your taxation and all financial kind of goals intact. You need really financial advisor, international taxation advisor, and you need to connect with people who have already experience of doing it and who have your kind of well-being, financial well-being and health in mind in order not to have stress, not to have, you know, losses, financial losses, and as well as, you know, personal disappointed and mistakes along the way. Thank you very much, Todd. And I believe that people would understand more now about this process and people would connect with you. And I would like to outline again that Todd Tashmekel, regarding, regardless of living in Alberta, has license to serve clients in Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario, correct? Correct. In fact, about a third of my clients are in each of those locations. Or, or even by the way they are relocated to, to Mexico, you can still serve them, correct? Oh, I, have, I have many clients in South America, primarily Mexico. And, uh, but also, in, like I said, Nicaragua, Panama, Costa Rica, and some of them are snowbirds and, uh, and some of them are permanent residents. But and they, situation uh, might change. Yeah, yeah I mean, for snowbirds, exactly. they might reconsider their plans. And again, there is a case when you need again to connect with your financial advisor and to check, do you have enough finances to do it? Maybe you need to wait. Maybe you need to reconsider something in your plans. So regardless that we have... We think that, you know, with life, we already have financial education and we should have, but we cannot know all the rules and rules are changing. Yeah, I agree. And it's always good to have somebody else sort of give your, your thought process a, a once over sort of thing and point out some flaws. Like I'm not trying to stop people from relocating. I'm trying to help people relocate. But there are, there are ups and downs and there are sort of some things to consider long-term and short-term in terms of uh, financial planning and, and savings. Yeah, and, different uh, strategy, different strategy. Yeah. Let's work together, Todd. Let's help our Canadians not to make mistakes, avoid mistakes. Uh, and I will help them to land in the best kind of matching place for their circumstances. Because again, there is more expensive places 
In Mexico, there's less. There's pl- places with, you know, hot climate and there's places with more moderate climate. For example, I prefer this kind of climate. And the country is big with different region, with different infrastructure and with different cost of living. And even mm-hmm. financial system, not the system would change, but Mexican states, they kind of different like American states. I mean, there is difference between states as we have in Canada, differences between provinces. It all should be considered. And Mm -hmm. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning about Mexico already for five years. I'm traveling, you know, every year. I'm connecting with uh, many local professionals and I'm still learning. So don't do it alone. Do it with professionals. It's what I would advise everyone who considering relocation, even part-time life abroad. Uh, if people want to connect uh, or have further questions, you can connect with me on or uh, through Emily, whichever you'd like. And I have no problem answering some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd, for your time. Thank you to our listeners who have time and attention to listen to all. I believe that we provided a lot of value in our advices, a lot of food for thought. So don't hesitate to reach out, to ask questions, to connect with Todd Schmeckel and with me, Emily Braun. Thank you and see you in a couple of weeks speaking about another topic, how to prepare for relocation abroad. Bye.